This is TREP Wire Week in Review for the week ending July 29th. I'm Haley Keen with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Hendry, Head of CRE and Advisory Services. This week, the Fed hiked rates by 75 basis points, and the markets rallied on Fed Chair comments that the central bank will slow the pace of increases at some point. And Walmart gave a look at how inflation is shifting consumer spending as consumer confidence slipped again last month. And Q2 GDP came in negative for the second straight quarter, just as the market feared. Manis, what are these data points really telling us? Well, to me, it feels like we're back before mid-June 2022. I felt that there was an awful lot of complacency before the June CPI number. People were expecting a soft landing. They expected some rate hikes, but not uh, either hyperinflation or a a very activist Fed. Uh, There was a lot of bear market rally, rallying that we saw in May and early June, and people were pretty confident. We got really battered as a marketplace after that June CPI number. I think that we went from really being complacent to being terrified uh, as a market that continued pretty much to the second CPI number where people thought we were going to have runaway inflation and the Fed was going to be extraordinarily activist. I I do feel that over the last week or two, uh, and and some of the earnings announcements have been less negative than some had imagined. And the Fed, of course, this week was more dovish than they had been in previous meetings. So it does feel like we're back to that pre-June CPI mindset, which I'm not sure is a great thing, right? I do think that there's an awful lot of complacency. Clearly, we saw a real surge in equity prices on Wednesday after the announcement, and particularly after Powell's remarks. The NASDAQ jumped 4% that day. Uh, Another rally today. So clearly, we're back to risk on. I just don't know if it's justified. You know, when you scratch beneath the surface, there's a lot to peel back and not a lot of it is great. And I'll let Lonnie throw in his two cents there and then I'll get into some of these anecdotes that I'm seeing, but uh, it feels like optimism is front running reality a little bit right now. Yeah, I would agree with you on that, Manus. It's two quarters in a row where GDP numbers have not come in. I'm in a positive form signaling we're probably on the verge or already in a recession. There's a lot of political debate on on whether we are or we aren't in a recession. We have some conflicting figures. Unemployment's still really low. There's some things that you could, you know, attach yourself to and say the economy still is in pretty good shape. Uh, inflation is just, you know, this bugaboo that we can't get rid of. But then you look at some of the reported earnings, Walmart, a few others we'll talk about in a little bit, and there's some real signs of slowdown in the marketplace. Um, so, you know, we've talked the last couple of weeks around just single family residential market and, you know, they feel the impacts of rising interest rates maybe quicker uh, due to the nature of significantly more transactions than in the CRE space. And so I have a few bullets there. Before I get to that, though, you know, just to echo where we're at in terms of the, the macro, the consumer confidence index for July slipped again to 957 that was uh, down from June's revised number of 98.4. It's the lowest index reading since February of 21, um, but it still is considerably above deeply pessimistic reading from the Great Recession when the index fell to 25.3. So, you know, all things considered, we're not anywhere close to that, but we're still significantly less than we've been in some time um, on the sentiment front. In terms of the, the new home sales, they dropped to the lowest level in just over two years in June. Just more sign or understanding of the the impact rising mortgage rates have had, combined with uh, higher prices, dampening demand for housing. New home sales tumbled 8.1% to a seasonally adjusted rate of 590,000 units last month, which is the lowest level since April of 2020, you know, which was in the throes of, uh, of COVID just after March and the shutdown. So not great news there. Something interesting here is a lot of people rely on the uh, the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller National Home Price Index. If you look at the index, it says home prices in May were 19.7% higher compared to the same month last year. Uh, what makes this interesting is 
couple of markets saw a significant increase in the uh, the index. That was Tampa, Miami, and Dallas, uh, annual increases of 36, 34, and 31 percent, respectively. But there was an economist from Pantheon Macroeconomics this week that effectively said that uh, their clients should ignore the latest case Schiller data and that given current conditions, U.S. home prices are likely about 15 to 20 percent overvalued compared to incomes. And that was according to Pantheon's calculation. So a lot of tidbits on the residential uh, marketplace, which we think will you know, be a leading indicator for some of the, uh, the commercial uh, market. And then one other note just about the economy and, and, and macro terms, uh, there were a couple of scenarios run about 600 larger companies that employ more than a million workers could be at risk of default as the Fed carries out plans to raise uh, borrowing costs. This was from uh, Swiss Bank UBS. Under a much less conservative estimate, number could reach 1,300, potentially affecting the livelihoods of more than 3 million people. And that was from a story in Politico. So, you know, I think depending on which side of the fence you sit on, there's a few things you can hold on to to say, hey, maybe the Fed's uh, impact is being felt and we should start seeing things level off and maybe we'll have a quicker rebound. On the flip side, we're just now starting to see the impacts across residential markets in a widespread basis. We're starting to see a lot more companies talk through uh, layoffs and, and furloughing workers. And uh, you have Walmart, which is a very large retailer, basically saying they have to drastically reduce expectations. And so uh, on that side, there's there's some real quantifiable proof that the market is definitely uh, struggling relative to where it's been the last few years. When I look at these earnings, it reminds me of a story that one of our former co-hosts used to tell periodically. Joe, for our listeners out there who uh, was with us and, and doing commentary for about a year, he would tell the story about having a really cute dog growing up that looked great, but was kind of vicious when you went to play with it. And he would tell the story about how he would bring his high school buddies over. And before they would walk in the house, he would say, please don't pet the dog. The dog will bite you. And everyone would walk in the house. They'd see this really cute dog. They couldn't help but try to pet the dog, and then the dog would bite them. And he would say, what part of that, you know, warning did you not understand when I said that dog's going to bite you? And I feel this way a little bit with earnings that have come out over the last couple of weeks. The earnings themselves have not been terrible, right? We've seen decent revenue. They have not been big misses uh, on either the top or bottom line. But when you read the commentary and you hear the comments from the leaders of these firms, there's that snarling dog that kind of resides behind the fluffy exterior. And, and let's go through these these a little bit. You know, Thursday, July 28th, you know, this, we're, we're taping this after the market closed, but Apple just released earnings. The earnings themselves were positive. They beat on the top and bottom line, but their commentary that went with it said, you know, pockets of softness uh, abound, right? We all know Best Buy this week said the discretionary income of the consumer is getting squeezed and that's going to have impacts on us. Facebook missed, but it was more the Zuckerberg comments that said, you know, we're in a new world here. We have a very weak advertising environment that is challenging. We have to rethink our business model and how we're going to restore profitability to its previous levels going forward. So and that's why I tie it back to the complacency argument I said at the top of the, the podcast. I just think that when you look at these reactions that you have, and the most alarming one, of course, to me was Walmart, right? There may not be a more efficiently run operator than Walmart. They have enormous size. They have enormous pricing power. They have terrific systems that manage inventory. And they've gotten so big that they've been able to take market share away from a lot of other people across the U.S. And when they say that we expect forward-looking earnings to be down in the short term, high single digits, and maybe for next year as much as 13 14%, that's a wake-up call. Because you have to think that if that's their number and they operate as efficiently as they do, the numbers for retailers that are not as savvy or don't have that scale are going to see even more pain. And so that's part of my arc this week, that I think when you look behind the headlines of the earnings, which have been better than expected 
for a large part of it, there's a lot of storm clouds underneath. You know, I like the dog story, but I'm a car guy and we, you have what's called a 20 footer, which the car looks good from 20 foot, but when you get real close, it doesn't look that great or, you know, good from afar, far from good. Um, and I think what you, what you outlined is exactly what we're dealing with. I mean, you know, Walmart is a great example. And I think the challenge for these retailers, you know, it, it's more than just the inflationary pressure that the consumers are feeling. This is on the heels of the, the pandemic where the supply chain was so disrupted that they were placing orders. There was a bunch of capital infused in the market. You had consumer spending that was, you know, outpacing what it had done in previous years, yet retailers couldn't get general merchandise in their store. So they did whatever they could to get that merchandise in. Now we've had a softening of the economy. The consumers are spending significantly less. Inflation's taking a lot more of their money on, you know, necessities. And you look at Walmart, Target, and these others, and they have just an influx of this general merchandise that they can't get rid of. And so um, it'll be very interesting. And Lauren Thomas, you know, who's been on the podcast, uh, commented this week that uh, everyday necessities are eating up more household budgets, leaving shoppers less money to spend on items they want, notably clothing. So it'll just be interesting to see. I mean, Target, I think, you know, we talked about them about six weeks ago, Manus, where they were offering significant discounts on their general merchandise. So uh, Shopify was the other one that I thought was uh, kind of a headline this week. I think they ended up laying off about 10% of its workforce. And, you know, I saw some activity on Twitter, which, you know, they had been in a growth mode and had several new hires that recently joined the firm and then were let go. And so, you know, those are the things that I think, as you mentioned, if this thing really starts to sputter, those are the lives that are impacted. You know, people that moved across country to take a job in spite of some of the negative you know, perspective on the economy, hoping that they're going to get a place that's stable. They get there for a couple months and get let go. That creates a real tailwind for for the economy at large. So more to come on this. I mean, I think there were some definite, uh, some REIT earnings that started reporting this week. I think we're going to do a, a deeper dive on that next week uh, with our director of research, uh, Stephen Bushbaum. We'll dive into some of those once we have a more complete picture. But yeah, so not great news for some of the larger, larger retailers. Yeah, one thing we didn't talk about at all, which which may be maybe the tip of the iceberg for the kinds of things you're talking about, right? The consumer getting squeezed is that AT&T number where they said people are starting to have trouble paying their, their phone bills every month. And that sent shockwaves through AT&T, share price, Verizon, and other telecom companies. And, and that's the kind of tell where you start to say, hmm, this is really impacting. You know, I think that for people from Haley's generation, they would give up food before they gave up their phone, right? And that's uh, <laughs> when people stop paying their, their phone bills. You know, it used to be that way with cable TV, right? In the 80s and 90s, people would say they'd rather give up food than give up their ESPN and MTV. But now, now I think it's your, your phone. So, so Haley, you're one of the boots on the ground in terms of young people that are having to make decisions on disposable income. You know, people trading down from Heineken down to, you know, some of the, the lower quality uh, beverages out there in the, in the marketplace. I think we're in a world of hard seltzers for my generation and below. So it might be people trading down from the White Claw going to the, you know, Costco brand or maybe the Bud Light seltzer. When I was in school, which was a really long time ago, the, the high quality beer was Stroh's, which I think, you know, people would think was... Uh, super low end today. And if you couldn't afford Stroh's, you went with either Mickey's Wide Mouth or Jenny Cream Ale, right? Those were the, uh, the trade-offs you went as you got further and further into the semester and your discretionary budget got tighter and tighter. That's how you got through the end of the semester. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a pretty scene. So let's turn to some of the CRE property type news. This week, we have a lot in the office sector between sales and leases. So we'll start off on the property sales side of things and we'll go to leases. I know in the past we've kind of bucketed crabgrass and green shoots, whether they're leases or sales, kind of all as one section. This week we're going to try to segregate them. So we'll talk about uh, transactions first and then we'll talk about leases and see if we can paint a picture of what the, the environment looks like right now. Uh, unfortunately, on the office side, it does seem like it's more crabgrass than green shoots this week. Some of the crabgrass was, you know, fairly severe and it was the kind of stuff that you start to see when people get a little skittish and get buyer's remorse 
before the ink is dry. So let's go through some of these. One of the sales we looked at this week, this comes from Celia Young of the Commercial Observer. 1330 Avenue of the Americas is about to be sold by Blackstone and RXR for $325 million. This is a property that you would consider, you know, I would say moderate risk currently. It's in the 6th Avenue corridor of Manhattan, which is not, you know, one of the hipper areas that attracts uh, tenants like Google or Amazon or Facebook. It's an older tower. It was probably built in the 50s, legacy type tenant base, and the types of tenants that could easily uh, look to reduce square footage over time. Uh, it's a 40 story building on West 53rd Street. So, why did this get our attention? The first is the sellers, Blackstone and RXR, were hoping for 350 million on this particular asset. It looks like they're going to settle for 325. Not terrible, but it is an 8% discount to what they were hoping for. But more notable is that this property sold for almost 500 million in 2006. Harry Macklow bought this property right before the great financial price crisis at that level. Now, that's not a great benchmark. Anytime you're using 2006 and 2007 sales prices as your benchmark, you have to assume that they're inflated by 15 or 20%. But even so, if you assume that that's the case, that 325 is still a sizable decline from what was probably fair value in 2006. So that's one negative comp we saw. Uh, here's another one in Los Angeles. This comes from Biz Now. Uh, the Union Bank Tower on Figueroa Street uh, will be sold for $155 million. That building was once expected to sell for $250 million. So we're really seeing a 40% discount to what people were hoping for. This is owned by KBS REIT. Uh, it's a 40-story, 700,000-square-foot tower. Waterbridge Capital is the buyer. And interestingly there, I believe this was under contract for 165 just two months ago, and that deal fell apart and now it's being repriced at 155. So you're seeing kind of a seven and a half percent discount to where it was maybe two or three months ago. And that's the world we live in right now in the crabgrass side of things. I'll give uh, one more story on this. In Miami Beach, Starwood has walked away from the acquisition of 1691 Michigan Avenue. This story comes from Brian Bendell of the South Florida Business Journal, uh, who I like to refer to as the hardest working journalist in South Florida. He is just incredibly prolific in his writing about that market. Uh, this deal was pulled days before the building was slated to be sold. Uh, Capital, Starwood Capital pulled out of the deal uh, the article says that they will lose their uh, deposit as a result of this deposit wasn't used. It was two and a half million dollars. Some residential transactions will normally people put up 10% as a deposit. Here it was far less. But I think it, it, it speaks to the market we live in right now. There's price discovery going on. Uh, sellers are, you know, looking at discounts, which are significant, right? Anytime you're seeing something in that eight-figure range. You know, that's real money, even for a guy like Lonnie. And, <laughs> and and this will continue as we move forward. Yeah, it's interesting, man. As you know, I think this, we, we covered a lot of ground here on a, on a, just a few stories. I mean, you have one that was a retrade. So, you know, it was under contract at a price and that comes back and closes at something less. The Starwood story is interesting because if they had walked away from the deal, according to the story, a week earlier, they would have retained the $2.5 million deposit. They stayed in the deal long enough to forego the $2.5 million, but didn't close. Uh, so it makes you wonder, like, what what were the signs or what were they looking at in that one week that maybe made them decide to pull out when they, you know, a week previous had said that they would stay in? The the Blackstone deal, like you said, the 2006 benchmark's not real, but still, it's... Uh, considerably less than what you would have anticipated a building like that probably trading at and less than what they had hoped to get. So, you know, we'd like to wrap up this section though, with a little bit of uh, some green shoots. So we do on the transaction side, have a, a deal of the week in the office markets, 200 park place in Houston uh, was sold to Heinz global income trust uh, for 145 million, which is about $700 a square foot. It's a 206,000 square foot office. 
Uh, the seller was represented by JLL, brokers Jeff Hollanden, Kevin McCann, Marty Hogan, and Rick Goings. Um, and it's in the Houston's, you know, really uh, fancy exclusive River Oak section. So, you know, Houston is such an interesting market because we'll have sales in here for Houston office at 125 bucks a foot. Uh, I think we had one earlier this year that was going to be converted to multifamily. That was around $50 a foot. And then we have some that are 700 and those things can be very close in geographic proximity to each other and they can be sold within just a few months of each other. It's such a diverse market. Um, you know, you see stuff all over the map, but this is definitely a good sale uh, for that market. It's a good sale for that sub market. Um, you know, $700 a square foot anywhere in Texas is a really strong price per square foot for an office property. Yeah, I would call that eye popping. You know, for me, when I saw that $700 number, uh, I thought that was extraordinary. I think Houston, and I don't, I don't know the Houston uh, geography particularly well, but it seems to me a lot like New York and Chicago in that New York, you have Hudson Yards, which is the new desirable part of town, which is quite different from that Sixth Avenue corridor, which is the older stock. You know, in Chicago, you have the, the riverfront area, which has been very successful in attracting tech tenants, but it's really come at the expense of downtown. And it sounds like Houston is, you know, that river area is kind of the equivalent of uh, what Chicago and New York have created. And Houston River Oaks, both on residential and some of the commercial stuff is just the higher end. Houston's interesting. We could probably have a section or a segment on, on Houston as some uh, pod in the future. It doesn't have zoning. And so you have some very diverse markets there and sub markets where, you know, uh, highest and best use has been determined by the participants, not necessarily through zoning code and restrictions. And so it's a very unique marketplace. But to your point, there's definitely sub pockets there that outperform on a relative basis. So, um, you know, good news for Houston. It's good to see some good office news generally. And, you know, even on the crabgrass stories, I mean, you could find some silver lining in there to say, these are still active transactions that are closing. So even though the prices are less than expected, uh, we're not seeing that stifling in the market where there's no liquidity, there's no transactions, et cetera, et cetera. We're actually still seeing deals, even if they're lesser on a per square foot basis than what the seller had hoped for. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point. Anytime you see transactions getting done, uh, it does mean the conveyor belt is still moving. And I think that's a terrific thing. And I've been pointing this out to our listeners for a long time that we may only be 45 days since the really shockingly high CPI number in June, but we are now five months since the run-up in oil prices and the start of the war in the Ukraine. And everything we're seeing now will have been negotiated since those two events taken place. So it may not reflect the highest of the high in terms of inflation numbers, but it does really reflect higher energy costs in the, the prices that these people are acquiring new assets for. I will throw in one more property here in Chicago since that came up. This one here, I thought this was kind of interesting. I, I, I put it in the mixed green category. Um, the story was reported by many, but I'll give credit to Dan Petrella and Brian J. Rogel of the Chicago Tribune. Google will buy the James R. Thompson Center in the loop for $105 million. Um, so this has so many tentacles to it, and I'll, I'm interested in your uh, takeaway on this, Lonnie. Um, so the green shoot part of this is that um, that part of, of Chicago, the downtown area, has just been decimated with tenant losses. This particular property is not far from the property that um, lost B of A, uh, moving out of 800,000 square feet. So any deal in that part of town is a good deal. Uh, Google paying $105 million for this is terrific. I think that they're looking to add 1,000 to 2,000 employees there, and that will help rejuvenate part of that market. So terrific there. The crabgrass part of it is the price equates to just 88 bucks a square foot. It is an older office market. Uh, I think the renovation costs have been estimated at about $35 million. Uh, the very interesting part of this was that this property was slated for sale at 70 million, which would have been about $50 a square foot. The buyer said, we will walk away from from this and let Google acquire it if you sell us the city of Chicago, this other nearby building for the same $70 million price. 
So there was a lot of moving pieces there. The one other downside to this, is I think that there was hope that Google might take space in 135 South LaSalle, which is the property that B of A lost. That is not the case any longer. And that 135 South LaSalle is in all likelihood that $100 million loan is probably, I hate to, to use this phrase, but probably dead loan walking uh, at this point with that 62% hole in the uh red roll yeah it's it's an interesting uh this is an interesting deal for all the points you mentioned man as i you know again to try to find some silver lining here when google buys a building it usually adds to the local economy just in the number of employees it brings so maybe for the retail the restaurants the hotels some of those other you know businesses that have been struggling due to some of the exodus you know you'll start to see that recoup and then that's the short-term impact in the medium term, what you can hope for is that they renovate the building, they bring those employees in, and then that market becomes a little more viable for other participants to come back into the marketplace. And so I was actually out in Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and it is pretty remarkable when you walk through and see all of the empty storefronts, both on the retail side and the office side. And it just puts into perspective, we've talked about it some over the last couple of months, just how large that market is. Uh, both in terms of retail and office. It just, it's a, a very large footprint. Um, there's office buildings, very large in scale with with national tenants in there. And to see the, you know, it's not quite New York, but it, it you know, used to have a feel similar where you'd have, you know, a busy dynamic walking population down there at all times throughout the day. And that's just not the case anymore. So hopefully, hopefully this is a sign of some short-term win in the sense that, you know, there's at least two transactions now you know, the other buyer moving to another building and buying that, um, and maybe Google can uh, can help stabilize that market. Uh, one other thing, just as an anecdote, Twitter, you know, Bloomberg Market Watch, I believe this week ran a story on Twitter saying that they're evaluating their requirement for space. And this was uh, done, you know, or at least cited in a company email sent to employees. And, you know, they were going to look at markets like San Francisco, New York, Tokyo, Mumbai, according to Bloomberg. Um, and then, you know, maybe even closing up offices in Sydney, New Zealand, Japan. So, um, you know, that's something that as that evolves, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it in more detail, uh, but just noteworthy that, um, you know, Twitter is another, you know, one of these tech companies that has a lot of employees spread across the globe that are now trying to right-size their portfolio. So let's turn to a few other stories for Office. We saw some leases this week. Yes, the leases were not uh, much better than the sales in terms of, you know, the sales were crabgrass was, was outpacing green shoots in our story litany by, you know, two or three to one, but Lonnie teed up a great segue to some of the crabgrass that we saw this week. Twitter, as he said, you know, is looking to cut space and that, that memo was, was pretty clear. Uh, yesterday they announced that they were abandoning plans to open an office in Oakland. They had signed on for four floors at 1330 Broadway in Oakland. They were going to open that space later this year. They've now terminated that lease. So signed a lease, renovated the property, planning to move in, never will occupy, terminated before even taking physical occupancy. Not a great sign for San Francisco. But they also said that they were going to sublet some of their space at Market Square. Their headquarters is 1355 Market, but they also have an adjoining building at 110th Street, which handles some of their overflow. They are going to sublet, I think, a couple hundred thousand square feet at 110th uh, Street as well. That particular complex backs a 2015 Sasby deal, and Twitter has a lot of leases expiring there over the next six years, and they are by far the dominant tenant in that complex. So that is one to watch very, very closely. Uh, I, I guess the good news there is with Musk walking away, if you recall, he wanted to turn that building into a homeless shelter. So God forbid that that, that happens to that particular property because it backs a $400 million uh, CMBS loan. Another walk away here in Miami, WeWork has announced they're gonna walk away from 830 Raquel uh, it's one of Miami's biggest ongoing office projects. They were expected to take 150,000 square feet at the development. Eric Bojnanski, if I pronounce that correctly, of the South Florida Biz Journal reported this. 
I don't think we have to shed too many tears for the developers there. My guess is that those 10 floors will be eaten up very quickly by somebody else. Miami is one of the hot, hottest markets uh, around, but it is another side of the times like those borrowers that have walked away from sales properties or buyers, I should say, you know, we work pulling out of this is, you know, another sign that, you know, the, the markets are changing. Uh, we can walk to a couple of green shoots. We have two of those. So according to the uh, Silicon Biz Journal, uh, Chelsea Wynn Flagey said NVIDIA Corp quietly expanded the Santa Clara footprint this spring, leasing space near its headquarters in the city. The chip designer leased just over 100,000 square feet in the Mission Technology Park Office Center. Uh, real estate brokerage Colliers reported uh, the lease earlier in the month. The lease was signed in May and is for an entire building in the office park and is for a term of 10 and a half years. And that's according to uh, Avison Young. Uh, so that's good news. Another green shoot here on the leasing front, according to the Atlanta Business Chronicle, uh, Savannah Sicurelli, uh, brokers, start your engine, sound effect, Haley, you know, consulting giant McKinsey and companies eyeing office space in Midtown as it pl plans to add 700 jobs in Atlanta over the next three years. The new office will house this technology and innovation hub, an expansion of the company's current real estate footprint uh, of two floors uh, in an adjacent building, the Beltline at 725 Ponce. The current office serves as its digital capability center now. So, you know, two large scale leases, you know, in the instance of the one in Atlanta, you're looking at, you know, 700 jobs, which again, you know, those employment numbers are not only good for the, the building and the, tent, the the landlord and the CRE perspective, but it's really good for the overall economy there because those people generally buy homes, uh, they start paying sales tax, they start doing other things that generate, you know, some some positive leverage in those local economies. So so two good stories there. You know, it's a funny thing when you go through the green and the crabgrass, and I'll, I'll take a detour for a couple of minutes. I was out with a couple of guys yesterday golfing, some guys that are in the CRE business and I don't want to name them, but I do want to say thank you for that great outing. Played at a terrific course. And for great golfers, I think it was just a, a great thrill for me. It was, while it was still a great thrill, it was enormously humbling. This was, you know, one of those courses where you could easily three putt from, from seven feet. The greens were so challenging. But at one point in the day, you know, we kind of joked that one man's disaster is another man's correction. You know, that... If you asked one person, you know, one friend, if I told you today that stocks were going to go down 20% between now and October, how would that make you feel? And one person would say, get up from the table, leave the restaurant, maybe get sick on the way out, and then go to the computer and sell everything that they have, right? Because that for them is a disaster. And another person would say, well, that's just the market, right? Market's correct. They go down 20% every couple of years. And that's what I signed on for. I'm not somebody who's facing retirement anytime soon. And, and yeah, you know, if I have a chance to prune some things and maybe avoid some, some pain, maybe I will, but this is not the end of the world. And, and that's kind of where we are in commercial real estate right now. You know, we are not in 2008, right? Where you know, values are falling 40 and 50% triple A bonds were trading at a price of 60, right? We are not there. Um, but when you talk to one person and say, you know, multifamily may have another 10 or 15% downside, you get a guess. And for other people, there isn't a guess. They know they've been through cycles before. They see this happen. And if they can't have cash on the sideline, they're thrilled by that story. But even if they don't, they kind of say, well, you know, we're not going to be in a recession forever. We're not going to have supply chain issues forever. We're not going to have $125 oil forever. And at some point, things will revert to the mean. And so, you know, I think Lonnie and I and Martha and Haley, you know, we struggle with getting that tone right. You know, for me, you know, where we are now is this is a healthy correction. We were getting into frothy territory in many markets, especially multifamily. You know, I don't think we're seeing 2008 all over again. I don't think we're seeing a 45% drop in values. I don't think we're seeing bank failures. For those that are living it every day and are kind of, seeing their monthly take home, especially if they're young workers or people that not at the high end of the income spectrum, this is a very painful time and it's no time to diminish that, right? If half of your disposable income is being eaten up by rent hikes and gas, 
that's real pain. But, you know, I, I just don't think we're looking at a 10% unemployment, 8% negative GDP collapse of the, of the markets right now, but nor should we be complacent. And those are my two cents. I'd love to get your thoughts about how you see things. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think it's, I, I appreciate you bringing that up on the pod because it, you know, it is a challenge for us as we go through each of these stories, because we could take a hard line position on either side. And in most cases have enough, you know, data to back up that position. And the reality is it really comes down to your perspective and what your objectives are as an investor, as an owner, as a listener. If you're in the origination business right now, you're feeling certain pain across certain asset classes, and you probably have a little bit of flexibility in others. If you're acquiring properties, you know, at this point, you know, you're, you're getting some stuff at a discount relative to what you would have been able to get it at a year and a half ago. And, you know, that provides some upside opportunity. I mean, I think we're 10 or 12 years into what's generally a seven year cycle. And, you know, the one thing that I, you know, have a little reservation about, and it's something that I think will play out, um, maybe not to the depths that it did in the, the great financial crisis, but you have an entire generation of, you know, investors, um, you know, GPs that have gone out and syndicated deals that have raised a bunch of uh, capital that have never seen a market correction or never seen a downturn. They've only bought things that saw rapid appreciation in prices, appreciation in rents, compression of cap rates. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, did they reserve enough capital for something like this when the market does soften and when occupancies dip below your historical stabilized occupancy or, you know, the inflationary pressure of cost for utilities and other things get to a point where your tenants have a hard time absorbing some of those pass-through expenses. And so, you know, for me, that'll be the part that I think there are definitely going to be some signs in the market. And those will probably be a tell when we're at that inflection point is when you see this new generation of investor, you know, really be squeezed and, you know, are they going to be able to, to make the capital calls and keep the properties? Or are they going to have to start walking away from them? We definitely haven't gotten to that point yet. The data doesn't support that we're there, but I would say that's probably the thing I would keep my eye closest on, um, especially in some of these asset classes like multifamily that have gotten pretty frothy. Self-storage would be another one where, you know, you've seen a huge ramp up uh, mobile home uh, parks as well, where, you know, you've seen dramatic valuation increases way above the the mean over the last 20 years. And, you know, you hope that people are capitalized enough to be able to absorb the downturn. But I, my supposition would be that they, there's going to be a subset of those that are just not able to do that. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, believe, I agree 100%. I just don't think that what we saw in 2008 was systemic risk, because this the, the losses were big enough to create sizable loan losses. Bank balance sheets were not nearly as healthy as they are right now. And liquidity was scarce, right? None of those three conditions happen right now. So I think to your point, the developer suffers and loses a lot of his, you know, perhaps personal fortune or seed money or whatever, and his investors as well. Um, but it doesn't, and there could be bank loan losses, of course, there always can be in downturns, but they're not enough to, to shock the system. But, but I'll, before we move on to the next segment, I will leave this off with a, you know, public service announcement to Lonnie's point about people struggling. You know, I always throw this out once every quarter, you know, for those people that are working day to day, the guys are delivering your grub hub and uh, the waiters and waitresses, please be generous with your tips. If you have the means, make donations to those food banks. People are struggling out there right now with the lack of stimulus, you know, the more we look out for each other, the more likelihood we come out of this in a better place a year from now. So let's turn to industrial. A few weeks ago, we had a listener who chimed in and said they were interested to hear our takeaways on the market. And we have several stories across the U.S. that we wanted to cover today. So this is for you, Dennis. You know, you said we relied on the industrial content. We'll try to make up some of the ground today. What I'm going to give you is kind of a litany of transaction we've seen lately. And then I'll try to get Lonnie to, to give you some color. What I was blown away on this was the disparity which people are getting per square foot by property and by market. You know, it's really seems to be a market that you can get as little as about 60 bucks a square foot to as much as a couple hundred bucks a square foot, maybe as much as 500 bucks a square foot, depending on location. Uh, there was a, a piece by one of the publications in California, it might've been the real deal, where they said vacancy 
in California for industrial is 0.1% right now, which if you, you know, I don't think I've ever seen that in any market, in any time period, in any property type, but just goes to show you uh, what the market is. In Santa Fe, California, 160,000 square foot warehouse leased to Anheuser-Busch sold for $85 million. This is 530 bucks a square foot. The property sold not that long ago for 35 million. So we're seeing about a two and a half percent or two and a half X appreciation in short order. The buyer was Thor Equities. The story was from Commercial Observer in Winston-Salem. You know, this is the contrast, uh, 4051 Wahlberg Road, a 610 square foot industrial property with lots of different tenants sold for 64 million, uh, only 105, 105 bucks a square foot. That's per the biz journals in between in Dedham mass, a hundred rust craft road, a 422 K square foot industrial property with two tenants sold for 134 million, about 320 bucks a square foot. Again, that's another, uh, his journal story in California, Rexford acquired several properties for 660 million. Uh, some were vacant, some were leased. The leases were 60, 80% below market value. Rexford just basically came in and, and ate up everything, paying uh, 450 bucks a square foot for a million square feet. The biggest property being in Eastvale, Glendale, Arizona, Lacken Park building 1A, sold for 150 bucks a square foot. The buyer was Bentel Green Oak. Um, that's a 730K square foot property. Um, and in Irvine, California, this is from Globe Street, JP Morgan. And I think now that I look at it, it was Globe Street who said it's a 0.1% vacancy rate in that market, Southern California. Uh, JP Morgan paid 180 million for 460,000 square feet in an Irvine, California, uh, industrial property there. I think it was the largest industrial trade in about four or five months and values just keep going up in that particular area. This particular property, uh, 5555 Jerupa Street in Ontario, CA. So two tenants there, Liberty Hardware and Seva Logistics. So a lot going on. Maybe Lana, you can help me make head or tail out of this. Yeah, so industrial is a very interesting asset class for a couple of reasons. And I think, you know, you mentioned the disparity in the sales price per square foot. And when we think of industrial, we think of this unsexy, you know, asset class. It's just usually concrete tilt wall construction, large open floor plates, and not much more. Um, but depending on the intended use and the way the building's finished out, it can really impact the value. So a lot of these buildings that are used for distribution, Ease of access, number of overhead doors, uh, clear height on the inside so they can actually measure storage in cubic feet instead of just square feet. All of those things directly impact the sales price per square foot, as well as the depth of the base. So if they have significantly more uh, depth to store merchandise, et cetera. Uh, you can also see these that are like flex offices where you have a flex warehouse where you have a large percentage of office or air conditioned warehouse space. Um, and those will obviously trade at higher prices per square foot. So, you know, it's it's hard to look at industrial, you know, from a broad brush perspective and say, oh, the average price per square foot is X because each of those components really contributes to that bottom line price per square foot. The uh, the tenant roster also impacts that. So in the first story you mentioned in Santa Fe Springs, you know, it's a 160,000 square foot warehouse was leased to Anheuser-Busch. You know, that's probably a very long-term lease that's guaranteed. There's a lot of incentives outside of just the bricks and sticks there that probably went into considering what to pay for that. So um, a lot of things there, something we could probably look at in a future episode of kind of going through and saying, is there a way to, to effectively quantify how some of those things impact uh, the value and the utility of those buildings from a data-driven perspective? And I think it's interesting. Like we don't really uh, segment these like we do some of the other asset classes, at least at, at first blush. But if you actually do the work and go into a particular market and you start, you know, delineating the different types of industrial based on those characteristics, then the sales prices start to make a little more sense. Your traditional, you know, warehouse type of uh, property will sell for a, you know, a range bound price per square foot. And then your, your larger scale distribution and whatever 
when grouped together, you'll see some some average and medians. It makes sense there. So uh, it's really nice that we don't talk about industrial as much as we do some of the others. So I think it's great that we could run through a pretty quick bulleted list here of uh, transactions in the market. Let me ask you this. Is there any sign in, in the stuff that you look at that industrial is showing signs of maybe getting overinflated, too hot? Maybe we've seen peak demand, anything like that? Yeah, I would say like when you see 0.1% vacancy, a couple of things have to happen at that point. Property owners are going to raise the rents until that vacancy number gets more in line with what you would consider to be the historic frictional vacancy. So, you know, if your stabilized occupancy in the, the industrial market is 95% and you're at 0.1%, by definition, your rents are too low. And so they're going to continue to increase rents. What happens there, though, is at some point they hit the inflection and then people find alternative uh, locations. And so, you know, even today, I think two of the stories were California. And if you look at the California industrial market in particular, that's been on fire for a long time and is, you know, ripe for some cooling down. You know, if I was one of these other port cities or port locations in Houston or in Alabama or some of these other places, I would really be doing some economic development work and trying to get some of those tenants into a lower price point location where they get access to the same, you know, availability of goods, but at a much cheaper price point. And so I think you'll probably start to see a shift in those dynamics but for now, the market still seems to be on fire. I don't think we're going to see anything next week. But over the next 12 to 18 months, you're going to have to see a cooling down in some of those markets. So let's round out our property type segment with multifamily. In Manhattan, 19 Dutch Street, selling for $500 million. I think that's a lower west side. I think property, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, $1 million per unit, uh, $500 million for that asset. Uh, 160 Riverside Drive in Manhattan, $415 million. That's about 910000 per unit. Uh, why do I bring those up? Only to underscore Lonnie's point earlier that um, even though people are worried about valuations, you know, high price deals are still getting done. And these are, these are really expensive deals. Um, three other deals, I just singled them out for no particular reason other than uh, their geographic distribution. Um, in Atlanta, this is from Real Estate Business Online, we saw a 331 unit property sell at a 70% premium to the 2019 value, a 3.65% cap rate to 2021 NOI. The property is Hudson Ridge Apartments. And let me correct myself. It's a 434 unit complex that sold at 331K per unit. This is in Atlanta, Georgia, acquired by LM Fund Management. So here we talk about you know value being up. 70%. The property sold for 143.5 million, up from 84 million in 2019. In Littleton, Colorado, Summit Riverside, a 248-unit complex on South Prince Court in Littleton has been sold. Here, what we're looking at is about a 55-60% uh, premium to 2017 value. The property last traded in 2017 at 50 million traded recently at 78.5 million, a 57% premium. Here it was a 3.35% cap to the 2021, a 3.35% cap to the 2021 NOI. Uh, and in Annapolis Junction uh, in Maryland, a 4.18% cap to 2021 NOI for the residences at Annapolis Junction. This particular property was sold for 150 million. That was up from a valuation of 112.5 million in 2020 when uh, this property was securitized. So, you know, Lonnie, we're seeing some pretty tight cap rates there. What do you take out of that? Yeah, the cap rates here are just, they're, non, they're not sustainable um, over the long term. I mean, I think I can remember back in my valuation career uh, looking at class A assets and thinking a six and a half cap rate on trailing 12 month NOI was a really aggressive cap rate in the marketplace. And now you're seeing these properties in secondary tertiary cities trading at 3.35% cap rates on the trailing 12. One caveat that I would say is for the listeners out there that maybe aren't as familiar with, with the financial, you know, pro forma analysis or looking at what a cap rate is or how you determine a cap rate. Cap rate is one of those uh, terms in the CRE marketplace that's 
uh, very ambiguous and used in a multitude of ways. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can look at a cap rate if you're the buyer based on the trailing 12 month NOI and you would develop what's called a going in cap rate. So that's what the buyer is going in at based on the trailing 12 month NOI. You can also look at a stabilized cap rate, which is effectively looking at not just the trailing 12, but a stabilized, you know, forward looking pro forma of what you think stabilized NOIs and cash flows are going to be, and then get to a cap rate that way. You can also get to a cap rate by including a reserve for replacement above the line. So you're actually accounting for that as an expense before you get to an NOI, or you can leave the reserves below the NOI and calculate a cap rate without the reserve. So this is one of those things that we all use as a proxy of the market, but I would just caution, it's another one of those items that you have to have a little more to the story beyond just looking at sales price and cap rate, because if you just look at those two elements on their face, it doesn't give you enough to make an apples to apples comparison across the um, the property asset class or even within a submarket. So, you know, historical cap rates uh, have never been this low, at least for this long of a period. What we're starting to see though, I think we mentioned it briefly on a previous pod was, you know, because the cap rates are so low and the cost of capital in the form of higher interest rates is high, you're actually seeing negative leverage positions on a lot of these acquisitions, which by definition means they have to see rent growth or they have to see expense um, decreases in order to increase the NOI to make it profitable for them from an investment return standard. And so I know you've mentioned the last couple of podcasts, man, it's around maybe starting to see some cracks in multifamily. And, and there's a lot of people that probably think we're a little bit off for that. But when you look at these numbers and you look at the historical cap rates and you look at what rent growth has been over the last five to seven years, I, I side on on your uh, you know thesis as well that these things are just unsustainable uh, in the medium to long term. And we're going to see some price corrections. I think we're already starting to see that uh, in the form of just Globe Street had an article this week that talked about just the slowdown in total transaction volume. And so that's usually a precursor. There's a slowdown, then there's a repricing. And I think we're in the slowdown phase now, and I wouldn't be shocked if in the near future, uh, you see some repricing on some of these assets and you see cap rates that make a little more sense where they're underwriting things with in-place rents. They're not projecting 10% rent growth year over year. Um, and you're gonna start seeing things revert back to the mean. You know, we always say the best part of the podcast is the the responses we get from the list, listenership and Lonnie and I both have very hard exteriors. So if you want to take the other side of the coin, we'd love to hear from you. We love alternative points of view. You know, the best part, we're, we're coming up on our 150th episode soon. You know, I can't tell you how enjoyable it's been to hear from so many people out there uh, over the years. And, and don't be shy if you have something you see that's different or alternative point of view. You know, we always love to hear it. And just because we say something on a podcast doesn't mean we're always right. That's uh part of the beauty of going back and forth with other smart people in the market, you know, you get to hear a diversity of, of opinions. And I love that. Definitely, Manus. We love all of your emails and tweets, so keep them coming. And that's kind of a great segue for my programming note today. It's our last week to weigh in on our CRE sentiment survey. So every week we're sharing our thoughts and predictions, but now we'd love to hear yours. Um, it's an anonymous survey, but we'd really love to get your thoughts on the market and where it may be going in the coming six months to a year. So send us an email and we can share the link with you. Otherwise, you can find it on LinkedIn and Twitter. So turning to shout outs, we have Rebecca M who spoke with Susie S who we frequently mention about our multifamily data. And she said she's a big fan of the podcast. Megan A and Ezra S requested some of our data that we spoke about last week on Houston office loans and modification documents. And then we had Dan M who reached out. He wanted us to talk more about office moving companies. He spoke with someone in the industry and he said the volume of what they're seeing over the past few years is a telltale sign, not just for New York City, but for major metros. I have this vision. You remember in the last Batman trilogy, you know, the one with Christian Bale? where Commissioner Gordon is attaching those little things so he can start tracking the, the trucks to figure out which one has the, uh, the big bomb in it. You know, Lonnie, you and I, should, you know, Lonnie Lugnuts and uh, Manny the Moose, <laughs> we should go out there and start attaching these things to moving companies and see, you know, if, is, you know, Goldman Sachs downsizing or is J.P. Morgan downsizing, right? Get the, that was a great idea by, uh, by Dan out there. I love that. 
you know? Yeah. So we've actually, we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the U-Haul index, you know, so like moving on the residential side, most predominantly, like what the cost is to rent a U-Haul from California to Texas is exponentially what it higher than what it is from Texas to California. And I, you know, this is a good alternative, uh, potential alternative data set for us to look at, to, to gauge the health of the office market. I think a uh, good suggestion, Dan. I think we want that video of Lonnie attaching the thing to a moving company and then diving into the, you know, the dumpster, right? Like they did in the, uh, in the movie, Commissioner Gordon dump, dumping in, jumping into the dumpster. And we have two shout outs from our residential commentary from last week, our own Stephen B, who we mentioned earlier, and Rachel from Tampa, who will actually both be on upcoming episodes of the podcast. So we'll let them weigh in on their thoughts on those episodes. So I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Alec P from uh, the CCIM Institute. Uh, they had me out to uh, Denver to talk to their instructor group. And uh, it was a really great opportunity for us to give a state of the market uh, for, you know, the, the practitioners that are actually instructing uh, the other CRE brokers, leasing tenant reps, et cetera, et cetera. And so really great opportunity. We really appreciate Alec letting TREP bring its data and, um, you know, subject matter perspective. To, uh, to their contingent. And finally, this week, uh, ice cream fans around the world are mourning the loss of the longtime summertime treat, the Choco Taco. I know, Manis, you said you hadn't even heard of this, so are you more of an ice cream sandwich fan? I do like that a lot more than I do with the Eskimo pie, which is a kind of a sloppy thing to try to eat. But if I had to rate my ice creams, I would say the Rainbow Sherbert from Baskin Robbins is probably number one. Then the Misty, Mr. Softy from the, uh, you know, the street guy with chocolate sprinkles is number two. And then maybe an ice cream sandwich, number three. That's where it's, it's my top three. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm from Texas. I'm a, I'm a Blue Bell ice cream guy. So uh, you can't be Texan and not support the Blue Bell, even though they had some salmonella or some some challenges a few years ago that they had to take it off the shelves. I'm still back at the, uh, being a Bluebell supporter. I would say though, Choco Taco makes a pretty good nickname for somebody. So we're going to have to find somebody that we can, <laughs> that we can coin uh, Choco Taco. And before you close Haley, I just want to say you did an excellent job on the pod today. It's really great having you in the producer role. Definitely miss Martha, but uh, you did an excellent job and uh, we're thankful to have you uh, on the team. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Lonnie and Manis. Glad to be here. And just to add to that, I was always a fan of the Friendly's Watermelon Roll. So if anyone knows what I'm talking about, give us a shout. And with that, we'll close. We're looking forward to having you back next week, Martha. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or just a comment, send an email to podcast.trip.com. Take our CRE sentiment survey before it closes on Monday and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>